Forbidden Topics is the name of the series, lessons that'll get you criticized, called out, or canceled. Hopefully not, but you never know. And uh, this is lesson number two in the series. And uh, the title of this one is Superstition, Astrology, and the Occult. Uh, Brother Harold is walking around. He's got some lesson notes. If, if you didn't get them on your way in, you can grab some lesson notes, help you to follow along. Just raise your hand and he'll be happy to do that for you. I don't know if I wanted people to raise their hand or not, you know, but I was going to ask, how many people here know what their sign is? Yeah, anybody know what their astrocall is? Yeah, I'm not looking who's saying yes or no. It's between you and God, you know? <laughs> In the 1960s and early 70s, uh, a survey that I saw said that 80% of the people you know, in the United States, 80% of the people knew what their, uh, what their sign was, if they were a Taurus or a Libra or whatever, you know, 80%, that's, that's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, many years ago, back in those days, they were singing, uh, this is the dawning of the age of? Aquarius, right? The dawning of the age of Aquarius. Now, most of us back then, we didn't know what that meant. We like the song, Fifth Dimension, right? This is the dawning of the age of, you know, we sing along, a nice wholesome group there. But we didn't know what Aquarius, uh, you know, that it wasn't, it wasn't just the name of a constellation of stars. It wasn't only the 11th sign of the zodiac but it was the code name for those who practiced various forms of occultism. They were Aquarians. They practiced the occult. That was the secret name. Now I use the word occult because it is a general term, meaning a hidden or mysterious or supernatural. And it includes a variety of practices and beliefs such as superstition, astrology, fortune telling, Satanism, witchcraft, magic, demon possession, spiritism, you know, just to name the major ones. All of these are under the umbrella of occultism, okay, or the occult. Now the occult didn't start in the 60s, obviously, with the, with the, with the song. It's as old as Satan. However, it has gained an unprecedented following here in the United States and Canada in the last you know, half century or so, where it no longer is practiced only in secret, but it has spread into every area of our everyday lives. You know, it's gone mainstream. Young people know about it. So we need to be able to recognize it and know what do the scriptures actually teach about this practice so that we can avoid being influenced by these uh, things and also that we could teach our children and our grandchildren when they come out with these ideas, you know, that we know what they're talking about. Now most persons uh, seek to have a kind of a spiritual or religious experience in life get to a point where they're looking for something more, something beyond what they're experiencing. You know, they, want, they want more. And for many, it is the answer to the beckoning finger of death, actually. Karl Barth, a famous theologian, German theologian, he said, death is the birth pang of faith. Makes a lot of sense. Death is the birth pang of faith. When you begin to think about death and realize that death is real, people actually die and you're going to die and it actually you know, sinks in, you start looking you know, for something perhaps beyond death. And that's where the occult many times comes in and satisfies that need. In our country, this quote, spiritual experience usually takes one of three forms. You know, people are looking for a spiritual experience, one of three forms. 
first form, for, you, for, for the sake of a, a better word, they, they, they experience a church type of spiritual experience. Formal religion with priests or ministers, uh, a definite set of doctrines, and usually uh, the religion that they uh, experience supports the social order. In other words, you know, uh, organized religion is not usually anarchistic. You know, we're not trying to tear down the government and blow stuff up, you know, normal religious type of spiritual experience. And you find most religious groups within this category, including Christianity. Uh, another type of religious experience that people have is the, the sect type. The sect type voluntarily rejects any compromise with the world. They usually reject any church type of religion and they make a point of it. They seek individual perfection and high levels of spiritual experience on their own. Uh, I'll give you an example, uh, the Mennonites and specifically the Amish, for example, they're like a closed society. They reject the world, they reject you know, modern trends. You know, they're trying to freeze time. It's part of their religion, part of their spiritual experience. And there are many different types. And then the third general type is the cult type. This group is characterized by mysticism in its ritual and mode of thinking. In this group, the individual seeks a self-fulfilling religious experience, usually provided by the mystic element that is within the cult itself. It is within this cult grouping that we find most occult practices happening since most are based on information derived from occult sources. So you know, if all, most of your information for your religious experience come from occult sources, pretty, you know, it's a pretty sure thing that you're going to be practicing occult, uh, uh, occult uh, practices, uh, whether you call them that or not. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, McMillan, uh, Lynn McMillan, I think we're familiar with him uh, from OC. Uh, many years ago, he wrote a book called uh, The Doctrines of Demons. And in that book, he lists some of the main features of cultic type religions. And I'd like to share those with you. Very fascinating. Going to go over them quickly though. There they are. So cultic, cultic type religious experiences share or groups share these, uh, you know, these features. For example, they usually center on a strong personality, a founder who has a vision or a mystical ability, or he, claim, he or she claims to be able to lead his or her disciples to higher levels. Follow me, I'll bring you to the higher level, a higher consciousness, one of the features of cultic religions. Secondly, they react very strongly against orthodoxy, okay? In other words, any set of doctrines that can be verified and that remain the same from generation to generation, they, uh, they, they reject that idea. They reject normal standards of religion. Truth for them is available to only a select few of properly initiated individuals. Truth is a hidden thing. And with the help of the leader and with the help of the, you know, the rituals and this and that, you will eventually you know, arrive and learn the hidden truth. Uh, cultic number three, cultic teaching reflects success orientation. They hold an evolutionary view of man and they teach that adherence will produce better people, super people, super men, super women, all coming through a retraining of the mind possible through access to the mystic powers 
or the mystic system uh, provided them by the leaders of the cult. You, know, you, buy into the, you buy into the cult, you buy into the system, you buy into the leader, and you, you, you reject everything else, and they will lead you to that truth, that hidden thing, whatever it is. Uh, mystic fellowship, number four, mystic fellowship with superhuman helpers. They believe that there are masters, gods, brothers that assist humans in achieving newer and higher levels of spiritual awareness. The work of the leaders is to be channels or communicators for these. Uh, many times, that's why the leaders call themselves prophets, you know, because they're speaking to the angels, they're speaking to the spirits of the other world, and they have the message, they have the information, and they're passing it on to the followers. Number five, they believe in healing powers. Power to heal the body and mind is a way of verifying the total system of belief to the devotee. The ability to heal confirms the doctrines. Number six, psychic powers. Psychic powers often designate the elite among the group. Mastery of secret knowledge produces psychic powers that are unavailable to the outsiders, not available either to casual members, you know, so there's encouragement to total devotion so that you can access more power, more insight. And many times total devotion isn't just attending the meetings. Total devotion is turning over your bank account and turning over your life and turning over you know, whatever you have to the group. They also believe in ceremonial magic. Uh, the goal of course of uh, the cultic experience is transformation transformation to the highest state of being. And often magic is a means to gain mental concentration. Uh, and I'll discuss magic a little later on in this lesson. Uh, number eight, syncretism of religions and philosophy. Syncretism means you know, taking something from here, from here, from here, from there, you know, and kind of putting it all together, if you wish. And so in cultic, uh, systems, uh, these groups uh, include features and teachings from every kind of philosophy, philosophy and types of religion. So they're a kind of uh, hybrids, you know, they, they, they pick the best, you know, they cherry pick what they want from different ideas and philosophies, even religions, and they, they bring that together and formulate their own uh, doctrines, their own teachings. And then cultic groups appeal to individuals, not families. They prey on fragmentation of family to influence those who are lonely and unfulfilled, have no direction in life. That's a candidate for a, a, you know, a cultic group. So we can see that some of these features have permeated into more church type of religious organizations, right? I mean, we see churches that have dynamic, strong leaders, like one leader is in charge of the whole, you know, the whole church. Unlike uh, what we see in the New Testament where we have a, uh, you know, a group of, uh, of elders who are responsible for, for, for the people and then there are deacons who do this and the ministers who do that. In cults, usually all of that power is all invested in one dynamic, uh, individual. Well, we see that happening in churches as well. One dynamic individual is in charge of the entire church. You have a 10,000 member church and the pastor is the boss of that church. Well, that, that, doesn't, that type of thinking doesn't come from the New Testament. Um, syncretism. In other words, we see a lot of churches pick and choose stuff from different churches and different groups to formulate their practices. All right. I mean, the Unitarian Church, for example, is a good example of that. They also appeal to those who are alone. And many churches today uh, have what we call the success gospel, right? 
He preached the success gospel. Sanctification and success go hand in hand. The more you become devoted to the Lord, the more you should also be experiencing financial and personal success. So there was a time when, you know, here in the United States, every major newspaper carried the daily horoscope. I can remember before I became a Christian, I mean, back in the 60s, uh, in, I was in high school in the early 60s, and I remember you know, buying a newspaper in the morning. I've always been a newspaper reader, and, I, and the, I'd buy the Montreal Gazette because it was the morning paper, and I'd bring it to school with me, and at lunch I'd be you know, going through sports and this and that, and I would look every day at my horoscope because it was there, and it, it was in the morning Gazette, in the evening it was the Montreal Star, and it had a horoscope as well. It's amazing. There are 10,000 full-time astrologers in the United States. There was a time there were more astrologers here than we had preachers. <laughs> we also have occult fairs, conventions, organizations with tax-free status are plentiful. I know about these because I've attended them. Now I've attended them as a Christian out of curiosity because in Montreal there's a lot of that. And they had one at, I think, the Expo, like uh, Expo Stadium. And, uh, and I went and it was just amazing. My eyes were open, I never saw anything uh, like that. Today, of course, uh, we've got the internet. So another mode of communication, the, uh, the Reddit occult site alone, one site, has 1.5 million Facebook uh, followers and 700,000 Twitter followers, one site. And as I was kind of researching, and this particular site, the Reddit occult site, is only number 19. It's not, it's not even in the top 10. <laughs> it's number 19. And it's got a million and a half uh, followers. So comic books, videos, games, movies, music, books, all of these things feature occult ideas. And a lot of times it's just that we don't, we don't know, we don't, we don't realize what we're, you know, what we're watching. The most, uh, the most uh, visible uh, marshalling of all of these things um, uh, several years ago, uh, was called the New Age Movement, brought all of these ideas together under one movement, New Age Movement, which was a combination of Eastern religion, occult philosophy, and American marketing. And it was often mixed together under the banner of environmentalism. So it was quite a potent movement at the time. This movement was the greatest challenge to Christianity back in the 1990s and at the beginning of the second millennium. Mystery, magic, astrology, Satanism are present in every area of our lives and most of us tolerate some or a lot of it in our speech, in our reading, in our thinking without actually realizing it. Interest in the occult has only grown, again, as I mentioned, with the start of the internet, providing a platform for thousands and thousands of sites devoted to its practice. All right, so that's just a bit of an overview, just to give you the lay of the land here. Um, I want to talk about the various types and practices of uh, occultism. Most common one is astrology. Astrology is the attempt to know the future, uh, the future course of events by observing and interpreting the heavenly bodies. Uh, the ancient art was practiced almost 2,000 years ago in Babylon. It was uh, actually the Greeks who developed the idea of searching the stars for individual uh, uh, destinies. Uh, modern astrologers use the characteristics of each sign in the zodiac and the position of the planets in the solar system at the moment of birth, along with information from the houses, similar to signs, and then charts which areas of our life will be influenced 
by the planets. Uh, horoscopes are the most popular form and practice of the occult. You know, it's, it's for amateurs, it's for people who are just curious. You know, what's going to happen? I'm going to read my horoscope. Oh, my horoscope says, you know, I mean, it's about as accurate as a fortune cookie. You know what I'm saying? It's about the same thing. But there are people who practice this art much more seriously and they have an, an entire chart made of their lives and they make no serious decisions in their lives without consulting their horoscope. Another type is fortune telling. The Bible calls it divination, but you know, today we don't call it that you know, divination much. Fortune telling, I think, has a more pleasant sounding uh, type thing. Uh, divination comes from the Latin word meaning gift, gift of prophecy. The term implies the ability to know through some means, whether it's a crystal ball or tarot cards or tea leaves or dice or palm reading, whatever, but that you have the ability to tell the events of the future. It's illegal in the United States and so most get around it by simply claiming to give advice. Uh, spiritism uh, or spiritualism, some call it that, in this general area is where a person is used as a medium to speak to the dead in order to know the secrets of the future. Another type, Satanism. Two forms of Satanism. There's the actual worship of Satan as a powerful spirit God that grew out of a primitive worldview. Zoroastrianism, uh, you know, the idea uh, they used fire in their worship and they had the idea of a good and evil beings you know, in, in conflict with each other. And that the earth was a, created and dominated by the evil spirit and uh, worship and cult of evil developed based on that. This one in its many forms includes human and animal sacrifices. Uh, all forms of occult practices, mystic rituals, and it's very secretive. I mean, it's very secretive. That's the first type of Satanism, the actual worship of Satan. Then there's the popularization of Satan worship through what was called the First Church of Satan, which was founded in 1966 by Anton LaVey. This and other groups, they call them churches, uh, such as the Church of Evil or the Church of Satanic Brotherhood, they don't actually believe in the existence of a Satan, but they use him as a symbol for their group that is dedicated to the worship of the flesh and not any spirit. Uh, this is why their main activities, they involved in orgies and all type of sinful activity is practiced. The second group here, the, this is the Hollywood you know, Satanism. Uh, this is the, uh, you know, the dilettantes. You know. They don't really believe in Satan, the actual being. You know. They just believe in uh, worship of a Satan type character. As I said, true Satanism uh, is very secret secretive in nature. You won't, you won't find ads and you certainly won't get anybody going on Oprah talking about it, okay? Because many times it involves murder. It involves the killing not only of animals, but even of, of human beings. So you, you need to be careful. Uh, very quickly, witchcraft comes from the Celtic word Wicca, which means wisdom. Uh, primitive witchcraft developed out of early society worship of nature and the practice of religion devoted to understanding and controlling nature through the use of magic. So fertility was a great theme in these nature religions because you know, uh, fertility was important in an agrarian society. You wanted your crops to grow, you wanted your animals to multiply, you wanted your wife to have many children to manage the farm. And so 
there were a lot of fertility gods, you know, and the prayers and the, the, and the offerings were to make, you know, to make your, 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 your flock fertile, to make your land fertile, to make your wife fertile, same, same idea. And so since fertility was a great theme, uh, the primary God for this was female. And so witches tended to be um, uh, used. Modern witchcraft is still steeped in concepts of the past, but has taken on a kind of a modern image and it's more organized than it was before. Now, don't get me wrong, Halloween, you know, Halloween quote, witches, you know, these are a stereotype that is far from the truth of what modern witchcraft is like. You know. uh, that's again, that, those are Hollywood witches or story witches, okay. Uh, they have true witchcraft, have a distinct religion with deities. The male deity represents death. The female deity uh, represents life. And you can see why, the female deity, because she produces children and, and animals, uh, female animals produce other animals and so on and so forth. Uh, and they have churches, they don't call them churches, they call them covens with high priests and priestesses rather. They have their own rituals, they have a belief system. But remember the goal of witchcraft is spiritual fulfillment, interpreted as the full manifestation of the mystical powers within themselves and nature. And so to achieve this, includes the following of what is called the Eightfold Path. Uh, these are a series of activities that'll help achieve fulfillment. Some of these are meditation, dance, fellowship, the drinking of wine, flagellation, meaning whipping, you know, uh, ceremonial intercourse, uh, the sacrifice of animals, incantations, you know, all kinds of activities such as this uh, that um, they um, participate uh, in, and all of it to reach a goal of spiritual fulfillment. Again, remember what I said about the occult. A lot of it is to reach a higher plane and each different type has a different way and a different history, but it usually uh, revolves around you know, a transformation of some kind. And the witches and the Satanists and the fortune tellers, they're the ones who are going to show you how to get to that next level, basically. And then there's, of course, as I said, magic. Magic is the attempt to control or manipulate higher or unseen powers or beings through the use of objects, incantations, and rituals. Serious magic, and I'm, I mean not show business magic, you know, I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna make a GM a truck disappear, you know, that, that's show business magic. Serious magic strive for harmony between themselves and the mystical powers within nature in order to achieve, again, the highest level of self-fulfillment. Magic is an element used in many forms of occult practice. So witchcraft uses magic, okay? Uh, fortune telling uses magic and so on and so forth. So it's an element used by a lot of these other practices. All right, let's uh, talk about my favorite, demon possession. The invasion of a human being by an evil spirit or power. Now, the New Testament attests to the reality of demon possession, but most of our concepts about possession today are derived from superstitions that arose in the Middle Ages and of course the popularization of these through the media in the last 50 years. I mean, has anyone not heard of the movie The Exorcist? 
I remember not knowing what that was about and going to the movies to see it by myself and I sat there in the dark theater, wow. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it's the story of a young girl who's possessed by an evil spirit and can only be driven out by a priest, a Catholic priest, performing the Roman Catholic rite of exorcism. And that's a true thing in the Catholic Church. You know, the rite of exorcism is a true thing, okay? So in the Middle Ages, demon possession claims were closely associated with occult practices and witchcraft. Sociologists report that so-called demon possession is reported most often in primitive pagan cultures. However, demon possession begins to decrease dramatically as the level of civilization and education increases, okay? Mostly cited in ancient times to explain deviant behavior and patterns. So if someone, you know, 500 years ago, if someone was depressed, a lot of times they would say, oh, she has a demon. Or if someone had what today can be treated, some type of mental illness that could be treated today with medication and counseling, whatever. Back in those days, you know, if you were at all, you know, dis, you know, disjointed mentally and emotionally, the first conclusion was, whoop, this person is possessed uh, by a demon. Uh, the state where uh, one uh, believed that he was possessed often induced through occult rites and the drinking of blood and the taking of drugs. In other words, a lot of modern people who think that they were possessed by demons think that because they were, they were participating in occult practices, which brought on that, what I call psychosis. Um, we need to be able to tell the difference between demon possession, which is an actual invasion of the body by a demon, and demon obsession, which is a persistent and haunting thought or feeling that can be manufactured and once produced acts or reacts like possession. In other words, you can be so obsessed with the idea that you act like a person who is possessed by a demon, even though in reality you are not. A common symptom among those who suffer obsessive syndrome is the belief that one's being is being subdued by an alien or a spirit being. A person's guilt may combine with deep fears of possession and produce a condition which resembles demon possession, okay? Uh, you can actually treat what's called demon possession. And I ask you this, what's the difference? Demon possession or you think you're Abraham Lincoln? You know, we have people who are in, in mental hospitals, you know, psychiatric hospitals, you know, who think that they're Jesus or who think that they're Napoleon. I mean, they really do believe that they're Napoleon. And among them, there's some that think that they are the devil or the devil possesses them. Well, they have a, you know, they have a psychosis. They're obsessed with this idea and this idea manifests itself, okay? So the question that you get when you talk about this is, can people be, let me say this again, can people be possessed today and why? And the answer to that very simply is no, people cannot be possessed today. They can be obsessed today, yes, but they cannot be possessed today. And as I'm you know, closing out my lesson here, I want to give you four reasons for that. First of all, Satan, the greatest of evil spirits, has been bound according to the promise of scripture. Zechariah chapter 13, verse one and two. The promise there is that with the establishment of God's kingdom, there would be a curtailing of Satan's power. And then there's Luke 10, verse 18, and 11, 21 to 23, and John 12, 31, all of these, they talk about Jesus accomplishing this task and proving it 
by giving the power to do this to his disciples. You know you have legitimate power when you're able to do something you know, supernatural and then give that power to somebody else to do. That's real power. And so we read about Jesus casting out spirits from people who truly were possessed. They weren't obsessed, they were possessed. How do we know? Because Jesus was speaking to the demon and the demon was speaking to him. And Jesus cast these spirits out. And then he gave this power to his apostles and they cast out spirits. Romans 8, 38, Paul tells us that nothing can separate us from God, no evil spirit can, uh, can possess us. Another reason, demon possession is ceased in the apostolic era. Acts chapter 5, 6, uh, 16, 8, 7, 1 Corinthians 12. Don't have time to argue and show you the scriptures for all of these, but I think among ourselves we, we know these. In the book of Acts, we see the apostles using their gifts to confirm the gospel. And one of those gifts was casting out demons. Persons who were already possessed by demons during the time of the crucifixion would remain so, or they could be healed by the apostles and those that the apostles laid hands on. However, because of the victory of Christ at the cross over Satan, the power of possession ceased. There are no new victims. Jesus cast out Satan. The apostles healed in their time. There's no need for this gift since possession is no longer possible. Now, as I say, there may be obsession, uh, uh, but the word can deal uh, with this, the word of encouragement. Another reason why we believe we cannot be possessed today Satan now works through deception, not possession. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 14. We cannot be possessed, but we can be tricked. We can be tempted. We can be seduced. And we can be seduced into being obsessed where the suffering is great. I mean, you take some kid who's 12 years old and from the age of 12 to the age of 18, with uh, you know, earphones on and, the, and, and his speakers to max is listening to you know, uh, you know, acid rock, demon rock, satanic rock. He's got these things going on in his head and then all of a sudden as a young 20, 21 year old and he also participates in drugs, alcohol, lives an extremely sinful life. All of a sudden he starts thinking, you know what, I think, I think Satan controls me and starts to believe it. It is possible with God's help to resist Satan's attack. We have the power to resist. Jesus said, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That's, that's very good news. And then another one, a little more modern, modern demon possession can be clinically analyzed as emotional disturbances and they can be treated. So obsession, you know, we've described with you know, a compulsive type of hallucination. Dis, uh, dissociation is a term uh, for a uh, psychological condition. Uh, one form of dissociation is uh, multiple personality. We've heard of that, haven't we? A person thinks you know, there's several people living without, within himself or herself. I mean, uh, I've heard of you know, people have 60, 50, 60 different. I remember there was an individual in Canada in one of our congregations in Canada who actually came to church 
And one of his, it was a man, one of his personalities was he was a faithful member of the church. <laughs> he came and he took communion, he sang the songs, he knew the lingo, brother, how are you? Nice to see you, God bless, a great day, glory be to God. And then something switched over and he was hairy or something, you know, and he was this other guy. He was a burglar, he was a this. Uh, and then he was a woman. And then he was a child. I remember speaking to him. I, I did not attempt any type of psychological counseling because obviously I wasn't qualified, but I was qualified to do one thing. I was qualified to continually preach to him the gospel. And when we got together and he wanted to talk, I would tell him, I forget the name, but I said, I want to, I want to talk to John. John was the member of the Church of Christ. I want to talk to John. And then John would show up and, I, and we'd talk, you know, and I would encourage him to stay faithful and keep his nose in the, in the book and reassure him. And he said, what about these other guys? And, and I gave him a task. And his task was, why don't you begin converting these other people with you? Why not preach the gospel to Harry and preach the gospel to Mary? And why not, you know, uh, I was joining him in his fantasy, but to him that made a whole lot of sense, gave him purpose. Anyways, uh, another type is, uh, I also have trouble pronouncing this one, Somna, somnambulism, somnambulism, sleepwalking, sleepwalking syndrome, and also what's called contagion syndrome. We call it sometimes mob influence. You ever wonder, two people together, they're standing there watching what's going on, uh, would never think of running up and trying to jump over the gate and knock something down or pick up a rock and throw it through a window. But then those two same quiet people are surrounded by a hundred other people all yelling and, the, and they get caught up in the, the mob influence, if you wish. And they, you know, they get, uh, yeah, it's called contagion syndrome. That's why you have a, a, a peaceful march coming along and there's a thousand people in the peaceful march. You don't need another thousand anarchists to turn that peaceful march into a riot. You just have to sprinkle people throughout those thousand people and they'll turn that thousand people into, into a riot. There's a, there's a term for it, as I said, contagion syndrome. It's the thing that's happening when people speak in tongues. That's what psychologists tell us. It's contagion syndrome. The individual is new, they go to church, there's 200 people, all those people are, you know, you know, and they're all speaking in tongues and everything. And the person's sitting in the second pew and saying, oh, wow, this is unusual. I've never heard about this. And he comes back the next week and the next week and the next week. And he, he, everybody's up and rolling around with their hands up in the air and all of a sudden he's going, cut us among the life of the life. Well, hey, I can do it too. You know, I mean, I've watched it. I mean, with my own eyes, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen to me. So we have to be, uh, we have to be careful. So Christians, our position towards the occult, very simple, it's forbidden by scripture. Deuteronomy 18, nine to 14, Galatians 5.20. Why? Very quickly, I've only got a few minutes left. First, it's forbidden because it's a form of idolatry. Depending on inanimate objects to manipulate God or to know the future is the sin of idolatry. It is degrading to God when we don't pray to Him but rather depend on things to comfort and guide us rather than on Him and His word. Things like stars, omens, spirits, rituals, and aesthetics. We, repent, we, we depend on all those things, but we don't depend on God. People put much confidence in telepathy or in spiritists 
in order to communicate with their dead relatives. And many are paranoid that Satan or evil spirits can possess them or talk to them. But Luke 16, uh, 26, you know, Lazarus and the rich man shows us that no one in the spirit world can communicate or possess someone in the physical world. The only spirit who can hear us to respond to us, believe it or not, is God. When I hear people say, well, you know, grandma's up there and I've been praying to grandma and she's looking down and taking care of us, all very nice and very comforting, it's just not true. The only, the only being who hears our prayers is, is the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Father, is the Spirit. So the only person hearing our, hearing our prayers. And so the only Spirit who can hear us to respond is God. And the only way to communicate to Him is through prayer. And the only way He communicates to us is through His Word. 2 Timothy 3.16, any other manipulation or way to know is a form of idolatry and God will destroy idolaters. Secondly, it's wrong because it's based on fatalism. Superstition is based on the notion that all things are predetermined and all we can do is find out in advance what will happen. And so magic believes that the forces in charge of the universe can be manipulated to serve human will if they just press the right buttons. Luck is the belief that circumstances are predestined to favor you. All of these practices based on the notion of fatalism are vain and useless. And they're useless because we can change things since we have free will and we have access to God through prayer who works for our benefit. God knows the future because He is eternal, but He doesn't create the future. We do this with our decisions. Fatalism is based on what's called circular history. Movies and books about time warp and back to the future and time machines are all based on this false idea. This is an inaccurate view of the reality uh, of the world. The truth is there's a beginning and there's an end. Genesis 1.1, and 2 Peter 3.10 tell us there's a beginning and there's an end. History is not circular. You don't find a hole or a wormhole so you can go from here uh, back to history uh, over here. That's science fiction, brothers and sisters. History is not circular that just keeps going round and round. History is linear. In the beginning, in the beginning, that's a start. And then Peter says, at the end, that's the end, okay? So when good things happen to us, they're blessings from God. God blesses all people, whether they recognize this or not. The fatalist gets no real joy from, uh, you know, from quote, luck, but he who knows the truth rejoices in his prosperity and he knows where to go in times of uh, need. One more, if you'll just be uh, patient with me. That's it, the last one. Occultism and the Bible is, uh, occultism is basically anti-Christian. Witchcraft, astrology, magic, create and foster insecurity, fear, instability. These practices do not bring peace or joy or assurance. The occult is usually accompanied by what is unnatural, violent, and talks mainly about death. It is against every notion and teaching of Christ and it is, its root is in darkness, mystery, and untruth. And what does the Bible say about that? But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. And then he repeats that same thing. Imagine, he says, even if an angel from God Give something different that's in here, you know. Never mind your sister-in-law who thinks she's a witch. So no matter how slick the presentation or nice looking the people, if you are anti-Christ, then you are pro-Satan and therefore doomed. So the basic allure of the occult is that you will find out something which you didn't know about yourself or the future 
or the spirit world, and that'll give you power or peace or meaning. But in Romans 16, Paul says, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever, amen. Romans 16, however, tells us that the greatest of all mysteries has been revealed. The gospel reveals the meaning of life, which is to seek and to find God, John 17. The gospel reveals the true self, lost sinners needing salvation, Romans 3, 23. The gospel reveals the person of God through Jesus Christ. The gospel reveals true spirituality, what it is. The gospel reveals the future. And what is the future? Well, that Jesus is returning and that we need to be ready for that. And so let's make sure we kind of get rid of our habits and books and things that have occult, protect our children, is dangerous. And stay with God's word as your, um, as your only guide. Uh, and it will guide you not only to peace and joy and satisfaction here on earth, but it will also uh, direct you to God himself and an eternal life uh, with him. All right, sorry, I went over time tonight. Uh, next week, just want to remind you, next week we're going to uh, start, uh, you know, continue in this uh, you know, series. And, uh, but next week we're going to start a, a, a three-part lesson on addiction. All forms of addiction, we're going to talk about addictions how they happen, why they happen, what's actually happening in your brain and so on and so forth. So I encourage you to be there for that. All right, that's our lesson for tonight. Thank you for your attention.